Okay, I think we're good. Uh, there we go. Okay, so users like fast sites. Uh, you can. <laughs> Um, you can, you'll get a lot of complaints from users, but you'll never hear a complaint, oh, your site is too fast, uh, you know, fix that. Businesses also like fast sites, and they like fast sites because they have a positive impact on the business metrics that they care about. For example, unique low, this, um, reduced their time to interactive by two seconds and found that the decreased bounce rate by 14% and it increased the average session duration by 31%. Pinterest reduced their time to interactive by 76% and that yielded a 60% improvement in engagement and a 44% increase in revenue. So today I'm going to talk a little bit more about that relationship between the speed of a site and the business metrics that you care about. After that, I'm going to do a quick run through of ways you can measure, improve, and design for speed. And that part of the presentation will be a little bit more practical um, with you know, tools you can take back to your team. So why does speed matter? Faster sites are going to have lower bounce rates. When I see a page that looks like this, I give it a second or two, and if it's still not loaded, I hit the back button, and I try to find a sim similar content elsewhere. And apparently I'm not alone. This is a, the graph on the screen shows a study done by Pingdom that looked at the relationship between page load time and bounce rate. And they found that for every additional second of page load time, bounce rate increased between five and 10%. A really nice concrete example of this is uh, TUI. TUI is a European tour operator. For example, you might go to their website to book a flight or a cruise or a hotel. And they tracked bounce rate during a 18 month effort to improve the performance of their site. You can see the results of this in the graph on the screen. I think this graph is super interesting because the relationship between bounce rate and page load time in that graph is so strong. And again, this was an 18-month effort. This was not a you know, two-week study done on a couple users. So the results are pretty statistically significant. Overall, they reduced their load times by 71%, which led to a 31% decrease in bounce time and 11% increase in mobile conversion rate. In addition, faster pages are going to lead to more page views. This is pretty intuitive if you stop to think about it. If I'm sitting around looking at pages on my phone, the amount of, like say I'm shopping, the amount of items that I can look at is gonna be bounded by how quickly those, those pages load. And for me, for example, in the shopping example, the odds of me buying are going to increase with the more inventory that I'm able to look at. GQ probably needs no introduction. It's the men's magazine. And then Nikkei is a Japanese newspaper publisher. Both of them uh, experienced significant increases in page impressions when they improved their speed. GQ reduced their page load time by 80%, which led to an almost double increase in uniques. Nikkei improved their speed index by 2x, which led to a 2x improvement in page views per session. For both of them, these translated into improvements in revenue-related metrics as well. For example, at GQ, there was a 108% increase in interaction on ads, and at Nikkei, there was a 58% improvement in conversion. Also, Faster pages make users happier. User happiness is something that's very hard to quantify, but a couple years ago, Ericsson attempted to do exactly that. They worked with a neuroscience lab to measure how users' bodies physically reacted to different experiences. So they were looking at things like heart rate, eye movement, uh, I don't know, they had some sensors on the head, I don't know what the word for that is. Um, and they put them through different situations. And one of those situations was mobile delays. The mobile delays that they tested out were making a user wait three seconds for a YouTube video instead of one second or putting a single pause in their YouTube video. That stressed out users just as much as watching a horror video. I thought that was fascinating. Um, I also found it as scary as doing a math problem. I'm an engineer, so I'm like, no, that's, math problems are so much fun. Um, so how do you make sure that your website doesn't feel like a horror movie? 
I think the best place to start is by measuring your website to figure out where things currently stand. A good tool for this is PageSpeed Insights. You can go to PageSpeed Insights, type in the URL of your site or any other site that you want to get information on, and it'll give you back a overwhelming amount of data. There's more data here than I can talk through in this brief presentation, so I'm going to focus on the feature that I think is most interesting, which is the fact that it gives you field data. In the field of performance, field data refers to performance data from actual users, rather than you measuring the performance of your site, for instance, in your office or whatever situation that you're in. The reason why this is important is a lot of times, and again, I'm an engineer, we're particularly guilty of this, you might have a really fancy computer, you have good Wi-Fi in the office, the, the conditions that you experience your website under are not the same as what your users uh, experience it as. So sometimes there can be a significant difference between what you're measuring at the office and what users are actually experiencing. So anyway, this field data section, which I've boxed in, uh, contains that data. There are two tables within this, this uh, part of the report. The first table is going to give you information on the URL that you entered into PageSpeed Insights. So for example, if I looked up YouTube.com, this would give me information about the performance of YouTube's homepage. The second table, which I also think is kind of cool, is what we call the origin summary. So this gives you the aggregate performance of all the pages in that origin. So for the YouTube.com example, it's not just the home page, but every single page within YouTube.com. I think that's neat because I think it's both easy to forget that there are other pages on your site behind, besides the home page. Obviously, the home page is very important. And also, sometimes like you want to forget that there are other pages because it can be a pain in the butt to go out and measure all those other pages. So PageSpeed Insights makes that easier. Google Analytics needs no introduction, and it's obviously not uh, a performance-focused tool. Uh, but it does have some performance data inside of it and a couple neat performance features. My favorite one is the fact that it can identify slow pages on your site. Uh, you go to behavior, site speed, and then page timings. And what I particularly like about this is it compares this, the page against the other pages within your site. So like, if your site is just slow in general, it will point out the particularly slow pages. Because some people, like, if you just compare it to whether it's slow or fast, every page will come back, and that's not helpful. You want to know what's the best and what's the worst. And to do that, look at the graph that's on the far right-hand side. Larger red bars means the page is slower, um, and then green bars mean that it's faster. Improving speed. So this is something I could talk for days on, but if I had to... Uh, break down my recommendations into a single item, it would be to set up performance budgets. Performance budgets set standards for the performance of your site. You don't tell users about them, it's just something that you commit to as an organization in regards to what your goals for performance are. Performance budgets can be defined in a couple different ways. They can be based on time. For example, having a budget of a less than two second timed interactive. They can be based on resources. In particular, when we talk about resources, we tend to be concerned with the amount of kilobytes on the page, because there's a really strong relationship between the number of kilobytes on the page and how fast or slow it is. So that's another way that budgets can be defined. And then a third way is based on Lighthouse scores. If you're not familiar with Lighthouse, it's a free tool that Google puts out that gives basically suggestions on how you can improve your page. But in addition, it also scores your page. And one of those scores is based on how performant it is. So uh, some people will set budgets for what that score is. Like a budget of 90 is a pretty common one. The reason why performance budgets are both a good idea and effective is they fight the phenomena that we see, which is that like sites on their own just don't get faster. That, that does not happen. They only get slower and larger over time. And so you need to put guardrails basically in place to at least keep performance constant, and if not that, hopefully improve that. And that's what performance budgets do. The other thing that they do well is they help you catch performance issues before they ship. Uh, not only is this nice because 
you're saving the user the experience of going through that slowness. But a lot of times, performance issues are much easier to fix before they're live, you know, when the code's still being reviewed. Um, and when we've talked with both Walmart and Twitter about their performance budgets, that's something that came up in both of those conversations. That they really liked that they were able to catch performance issues before they go out. Because, uh, you know, speaking from the engineering side, we tend to review code for whether it's correct, but we never review it for whether it's fast. And that's where uh, performance budgets can help. There are a couple different approaches that you can take to it, picking your budgets. Uh, one that's universally applicable to everyone is to assess your current site and try to be 20% 20, 20 faster than that. Another approach is to go out and look at your competitors. And if you're competitive, try to beat them. If you're less competitive, I don't know, maybe try to be in the median in your industry. Um, uh, or the last one, I think this is the most challenging one, is to actually hit those best practices that you hear Google and, and other people talk about. For example, having a, a one second FCP, first content full paint. So a tool you might find helpful when picking budgets is the performance budget calculator. Uh, I put this together because a lot of times people know how fast they want to be, but they don't necessarily know how to get there. So this helps you predict, given how many resources on your page, how, what the time to interactive will be. And it will give you both median and 25th and 75th percentiles. So you can uh, have, just kind of gauge what to expect. Another tool, if you're looking for something, I won't talk about this much today, but if you're looking for something to take back to your engineers, um, I would suggest Lighthouse, which you might be familiar with, but which you might not be aware of, is it now supports performance budgets. And that's through a kind of like an add-in feature called Light Wallet. Um, and the link up on the screen goes to the documents for that. That can be set up in about five minutes. How do you design for speed? When designing for speed, it's important to not only think of it, the actual speed, but also how that speed is being perceived. So Houston Airport, a couple years ago, found that they were getting a ton of complaints about how long it took for luggage to show up and the baggage claim. They looked into this, they tried a couple different things, they tried you know, hiring more people to work the baggage claim, and the solution that they eventually struck upon was moving the, the baggage claim further from the plane. Uh, this was highly effective. They basically got no complaints after they did this. <laughs> I'm hearing chuckles, so I can tell you're in on the joke. This is interesting because the baggage was, the luggage was not actually reaching the passengers any quicker. They were just making the passengers walk further. Instead of walking a minute to get, collect their luggage, they were walking six minutes. But it worked really well. Nobody complained afterwards. Um, and this highlights the fact that people are very aware of when they're waiting. Like, kind of, that was unplanned, but great example of when I was standing on the, the stage waiting for the slide to load. I was very conscious of that. That, that felt like an eternity. Um, and so when it comes to designing products, it's important to think about how can you make the weight feel less? And there's a couple. Uh, design elements you can use to help with that. One is replacing your standard old spinner with something interesting. When I look at the, the spinner on the far left, I know I'm waiting. You know, that's, that's basically like the international symbol for I'm waiting. On the other hand, when I see the two animations on the right hand side, well, actually, I kind of don't actually know what's going on, but I definitely don't think that they're necessarily telling me I'm waiting. For me, personally, when I look at them, it kind of reminds me like when you're about to watch a movie and the, the Pixar lamp jumps around, and there's like that little animation. So to me, it just feels like, oh, wow, really polished. Um, I don't know, I'm entering the app. But actually, I'm being distracted while I wait for the app to load. Uh, loading transitions are is another thing. So the clip on the screen shows your standard loading transition. You see a spinner for a couple seconds, and then the content appears. Contrast that with this. The same amount of waiting is being done, but it's not necessarily obvious to the user that they're waiting. When I look at this, I think that the transition is just part of the design element. It's part of the experience. But Actually, it's uh, disguising the fact that the content is, isn't ready yet. And then lastly, there's placeholders. Uh, 
a, a standard skeleton screen is a good start. Um, it's better than a blank screen, but it is not perfect. Uh, we do hear from users that sometimes they find them confusing, and they're also not perfect because there's really no feedback as to how the loading process is uh, proceeding. A better form of placeholder, though it's, not it's more complex to implement, is to add some sort of staggering and animations to make it feel more dynamic and give it a sense of progress. So that's it for me. That was a quick whirlwind uh, tour through performance. Uh, I try to summarize some of the resources that I talked about today up on the screen. And also tomorrow at 11, there'll be a breakout session on performance. So I encourage you to, to come there. So I think we have time for a couple questions, if anyone has them. If not, going once. I can't really see. Yep. Oh. So when you talk about just the differences in the waiting time, do you have any stats or data that goes behind how users engage differently? Uh, waiting, t so like. So like how much the transition was better than the spinning circle of death. Yes. Uh, I think it reduces bounce. Like if you were going to pull up statistics, and I don't know any off the top of my head, uh, you would see a significant difference in bounce. Like that'd be the first metric you'd look at. Hi. Um, with the lighthouse uh, metrics that come up there, um, how would you prioritize the different ones? Like for first content book pain, time to interactive. You have to work on all of them. Like, is that a priority thing? Like, how, how would you think about that? Yes. Sorry, I'm looking around. I'm like, I can't. I can, I know, I can hear the voice, but I can't see where it's coming from. Yes. Uh, Probably my blanket recommendation or general all-purpose recommendation is to set budgets for first contentful paint and timed interactive. And why I say both of those is there's a tendency, like one of those metrics will be very flattering for your site and one won't be. And so there's a tendency for sites to be like, let's just pick the one that makes us look good. But that's kind of masking the performance issue and the user's experiencing you know, the slowness that that other metric represents. So that's, you know, my my generic recommendation is to use those two. Yep. Uh, so one of wow, that's really nice. well, one of the things I've seen uh, is most of the time when people are talking about performance and conversions, it's often in a very linear sense. Improve your site time by one second, get this many more conversions. In my own testing and what I've seen from a lot of other people is there's often diminishing returns or a logarithmic curve to that, um, which I think showed in your second slide. The bounce rate, what yeah, it flattens out. Yeah. Experience in that, what are some break points or important numbers? So the top of my head, I'm not like, oh, after a certain number of seconds, you're good to go. But I think that is very true. And it applies, the slower your site is, in theory, the easier it should be to make it faster. Like every additional second of speed is you're gonna fight a little bit harder for. And probably how far along that journey you go will basically depend, I think, on your business model and resources at the end of the day. So, you know, we talk with some big companies and some of the stuff, like for instance, that Twitter does around performance optimization is really interesting. But that makes sense when you think of their, their business model. Like, Impressions are really important. And also, you know, they're a pretty large company. They have the resources. So they'd be in a position where they would really try to go as far, you know, maximize as much as possible. And they're also a company that's really trying to, to move and serve users in MBU. So maybe uh, users that wouldn't be on your radar, depending on what vertical you're in. Uh, if you're trying to reach someone on a $50 smartphone, like you really need to be uh, pushing the envelope when it comes to performance. So that's a really long-winded answer to, I guess, so in summary, I don't think there's a single benchmark, but yes, it's very true. The the more you optimize, the more you're going to have to fight for those additional optimizations. Yep. This thing's so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of times when working through this stuff, a lot of companies, local companies I've worked with, um, they're dependent on the CMS that they buy. And page load speeds and CMSs are like problematic. And um, so we've always had to go and dump a bunch of money into improving the CMS. 
um, in order to do so. Do you have any watch outs for companies because um, when developing or, or choosing a CMS that'll help perform in the long run versus like any short term kind of gains or what they fish? Oh boy, that, that's a long answer because yes, as, as you mentioned, uh, CMSs tend to be on the slow side. Uh, I know internally at Google, Google, we're trying to work with some of the CMSs to help improve them because it's like one of those things, if you can improve the CMS itself, it saves everybody else so much work because instead of each, every single one of you in this audience having to maybe like pay a contractor to try to improve your CMS, you could just kind of like fix the source. Um, but I would probably need to talk with you one on one more because a lot of it depends on like the particular CMS that you're using because different CMSs you use different optimizations for. Do you just recommend they not use the CMS in general? <laughs> not necessarily. Because like one of the things that all comes down to depend. It comes down to your business model. How big is your engineering team? Da 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 da. -da. Um, if you can avoid a CMS, yeah, probably because um, there's out of the box there pretty slow and you're really going to have to work very hard to optimize that. So yeah, that could be the easiest path is just not start with the CMS. Easier said than done, but. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks.